So, Network Society, um, my name is Erik Kruse. I work in a small think tank in, at Ericsson at Group Function Marketing and Communication. We developed uh, the story about the Network Society and the vision about the Network Society based on some insights that we draw and then we started to dwell on it and then we saw it take off. And what I'm trying to do now is to have a long introduction and then short piece about visualization and 5G because I think I heard this morning uh, we have some concern about will we be out of job. Uh, I can tell you that, that you that are working with visualization, you will not be out of work because it's needed enormously much. Uh, we see lots of change now happening. We see it among us as individuals. Uh, we see it in technology. We see now how science fiction items like self-driving cars is hitting the market. And it's actually based on our thinking, well, not based on our thinking, but it is those things that we see that makes up the story about the network society. You have all seen these pictures, but I think the important thing is that it's only eight years uh, between these uh, pictures. Here you see uh, Son Ericsson said 300 taking crappy pictures at the Vatican City. And eight years later, everyone is experiencing the reality through a screen instead of watching it live. Because now they are trying to capture the moment when the white smoke uh, or the smoke comes uh, from the chimney, stating that we have a new pope. And I think in 2005, I was a consumer researcher at Ericsson, and I could never for, uh, have foreseen that development. Because now we as individuals have adopted a technology and we are changing behavior based on that. And of course, we can see also that we see much more function because the technology has developed a lot. This is an ad from Radio Shack that is out of business for the moment. Uh, but in 1991, all these devices that was on sale due to the president's birthday, all these functionalities is now incorporated, uh, incorporated in a smartphone. And instead of spending 1991, $3,054, uh, approximately $4,500, you have to spend $50, and you get the same functionality as in the ad. And I think this development has been enormous. It has been affecting us as individuals, it's affecting society, and also it affects what are the possibilities that we see now in the future. And of course, we are only at the starting point, because now computational capacity is still growing exponentially. We see exponential growth in the amount of data that we as individuals, but all the machines that are connected are generating. And also the speed of the networks, what they can handle is growing exponentially. And now we are reaching the point also where we can reach everyone. Because we are moving into the fact that we have ubiquitous reach on the people, we have ubiquitous reach by 2025 or 2030 of things, because then we will have 50 or 75 billion connected things. And also, thanks to the cloud development, all the practices are getting digitized, and they are also more or less ubiquitous reach thanks to the cloud development. And then, uh, talking about new economics and the fact that we might be out of work thanks to the development of automation. We see now how transaction cost is going down. We see distribution cost reaching end users or business is going down to zero. And also the cost of utilizing the cloud-based practices are uh, uh, close to zero. So we have a fundamental shift in how society works and what are the economics behind it. And I talked about that we as individuals are changing, and I think now digital identity, our digital identity uh, is as important as our real identity. We want everything instant as end user. We don't want to wait for episode 354 of Game of Thrones to be released first in the US. No, we want to have everything instant. I worked in the record industry earlier, and when we saw that people actually started to share files, we thought 
they are doing it because it's free. No, they wanted the content instantly. And we did the fantastic thing. We tried to put our customers into jail. And I can tell you that's a bad customer relationship management ID. It's bad for business. Thanks to the services like that you have on your smartphones, Wikipedia, etc., we feel that we are always informed. My son, he's 18 years old now. Uh, when he was 11, he said uh, at the dinner table, Daddy, I'm living in the best of times. And I said, what do you mean? I don't have to remember anything. <laughs> because everything is available on the net. Bad ID for a student, but still, I think that is the feeling. We are in control, we can reach information, we can reach knowledge everywhere. And also, now we see a shift uh, where we prefer services instead of physical products. We want access to music, the service access to music through Spotify instead of buying records. We want access to Netflix, Viaplay, etc. instead of buying DVDs. But the biggest shift is on a global scale that I think we are living in a culture defined by collaboration. We share information, we share knowledge, we share even our own homes now in a way that we couldn't foresee 10, 15 years ago, because we are much more collaborative. And I think we see lots of innovation happening on the collaboration and also the digi uh, digitalization. This is a woman that we interviewed in San Francisco and more or less she has on demand at your fingertips. Because now she can order groceries through Blue Apron or Amazon Fresh, she can order ready-made food by Manchuri Spoon Rocket and it's delivered within a one hour. Uber and Lyft transport within a few minutes, Task Rabbit if you have done the mistake of buying um, stuff at IKEA that you cannot assemble, then press TaskRabbit and they will find someone coming to your home and do it for a small fee. And I think this is how the world is changing. And of course, there are new players entering the old traditional industries. And that is why we see lots of transformation, lots of disruption in the marketplace. And it's based on technology and understanding how things can be done in a different way based on ICT. Uh, my son, I said he's 18 years old, he loves Premier League. So now when every Saturday he and his friends are watching four games at the same time live. And I think this gives me a bloody headache watching this, but still my son and his friends think it's excellent. Um, so. One thing is, of course, that young people can watch four games at the same time and get some type of experience from it. But I think this shows also how traditional players need to utilize new technology, because the owners of the rights to send the Premier League games in Sweden is Modern Times Group. It's an old satellite company. But to stay relevant, they need to experiment and start using the new uh, possibilities with technology. So they needed to start to invest in a new platform, Viaplay, broadband TV. They got tons of data that they didn't know what to do with. And suddenly they became transformed because they needed to stay relevant to its end users, utilize the new technologies, and also abandon uh, all the traditional distribution ways of transmitting the um, Premier League games. So ICT is actually affecting old media companies and it's affecting whole industrial structures. Here we have made estimations on end user spend in the media business globally. The media business was worth approximately 400 billion US dollars in end user spend by uh, 2007. 21.7 billion US dollars was on ICT media. The big bulk was on records, CDs, newspapers, game hardware, etc. But we see how now the new ICT media services are growing to 104 billion US dollars and traditional media is losing ground. And of course, one thing to remember is that these companies that are quite successful in the ICT media, it's not the old companies. 
Amazon, iTunes, Spotify, Four Guys from Stockholm changed the music industry, took my record store out of business, Netflix, etc. It's new players that adopts and know how to utilize the technology and also play around with new business models, as well as not having old legacy um, <coughs> structures, old organizations and old uh, uh, production facilities. They can move in and disrupt the business. And what we have seen in the media business, I think that's the first mover. Now, every aspect of society, all industrial systems will be affected by this development. And I think the more slow and the exponential growth in computing uh, capacity is now not affecting the IT business so much. It's affecting the transport business, the car manufacturers, the utility companies, the healthcare companies, because suddenly you can do things in a radically different way. And when we start to connect things also, uh, it becomes even more disruptive because every product is a digital service waiting to happen. And I will show you some things that some companies are experimenting with, having good and bad ideas, but by connecting things, they can do things differently. This is CNA fashion in Latin America. They are connecting their coat hangers. Bad idea, uh, in the first uh, site. And then they put all their uh, um, items that they say, sell in the store on Facebook, and then they are displaying the, how many likes this jacket has received on Facebook on the coat hanger. And I thought, they are fucking stupid, these guys. But suddenly, when analyzing this, this is the first time this shop gets real-time data on the correlation between the likes and the sales. So they can optimize supply chain, they can see that the item hanging on the coat hanger with 213 likes will most probably go on sale next week. Because suddenly they can collect data and correlate sales with the likes. And I think this has really proven to be extremely efficient for CNA fashion. This is a good uh, idea, it's connected to medicine containers, uh, glow caps, by Vitali Vitality in the US. First developed for patients with Alzheimer's, the world's most expensive disease in the, um, in, uh, measured in dollars. Extremely important that you take your medicine on time. So if you haven't taken your medicine on time, it reminds the patient to take the medicine by glowing up, making sounds. And suddenly, the accuracy of taking your medicine on time goes up from 70% to 92%, which is extremely beneficial for the patient, extremely beneficial for society. And the business model is that in the bottom of each container, you have a button. So when the medicine is running out, you press the button and you get it home delivered uh, directly within uh, two days. And that lowers the supply chain cost for the pharma companies with 22.7%. And this medicine ex is extremely expensive. And I think this shows the power of connecting things if you can analyze what are the pain points and what are the different relations with different stakeholders. And of course, we see lots of examples on how business and industry after industry is changing. Tranquillion, made by SNPs, big data and open data company, projects how crowded trains will be leaving um, Paris train station up to 10 days before it leaves, uh, only using open data. Blah, blah, car, car sharing, go in, become a member and share a ride with other drivers. The brand name is that you can ac actually personalize who you are riding with. Blah, then they are silent, blah, blah, then they are talkative, and that is how the brand name came up. Uh, Uber, we all know, uh, in Amsterdam, old cab drivers are ordering Uber cars, and um, when the Uber car uh, arrives, they pull the driver out and uh, beat the shit out of him. And that is more or less the same reaction as the music industry had with peer-to-peer. -peer. They are trying to stop it, but it's unstoppable, actually. We can see it in uh, transactions, Airbnb, the world's largest 
hotel business without owning any hotels, Blue Apron on getting food directly to your home in a radically, way, a radically new way. Not old companies that are reinventing themselves, new companies, things that really are changing the mindset on how you can run your business on, with, uh, together with ICT. So we have a new logic emerging and anything that can benefit from a network connection will have one. And when it's connected, it becomes smart and interactive. And then any resource that can be shared will be shared. And when it's shared, it gets enriched and abundant, like the blah blah car. Any reshaping ID that can be tried will be tried and trigger change. And I think this is, yes, lots of startups are failing, but they trigger even more change because even if this company uh, failed, maybe next generation will actually be successful. So it triggers more and more change as more and more people are trying out and creating new services. And they are doing it on new assets. Um, the users that are participative, active and wants to share information, utilizing platforms where they can play on but other companies can create value. And more and more things, not only thinking about the laptop or the um, mobile phone, but new things that get connected that can create radically new services. And also data, own data, shared data, open data, and the combination of it creates new business processes and new value configurations. So one key learning uh, that I have received during the years that I worked with the Network Society is that digital does not respect any industrial boundaries. The digital digitalization will always uncover inefficiencies and creates new value. And I think old companies, and I'm representing a company that next year will have its 140th birthday, of course, it is a process to go through and it creates lots of tensions on how can we disrupt or can we be disrupted. Oh, we can skip this uh, thing. And then, of course, this is only the beginning because now in 2020 we will launch a new generation mobile network, uh, the 5G that is more based on not us as consumers watching Netflix, but on industrial processes. So critical communication between cars, we have extremely low latency. We have massive communication with devices that maybe connects to the, uh, to the network once or twice a week or even once or twice a month. But it needs to handle higher end user uh, data rates, 100 more uh, times more connected devices and being much more secure and sustainable. And today we are having a mobile phone that is this big in our studio and today we get 5.3 gigabit per second on this device. And we have five more years to develop it, so it will be massive and it will be very focused on industrial processes, which means that we will see new types of relationships, not only within the company process, but between company processes. We will see society wanting to understand what are the relationships between our behavior. Can we visualize it? Can we make it much more understandable? And of course, with the Internet of Things, as I said, we need to have a digital representation of the real world, but we need also to visualize that in a way that we can take better decisions regarding uh, sustainability, our business operations, we can innovate on, but also to both participate and collaborate on. And I will give you some examples where we see problems or possibilities already today. We are working with Mosel Valley winemakers connecting in the wine yards. And of course, what kind of information, when we start to connect the grapes and the wine stocks, etc., what kind of information is needed to display for the winemaker to take the right decisions? 
or with the Volvo connected car, how do we display information? How do we visualize complex information in a safe way when as today they are driving their car uh, by, their, <coughs> by their own and it's not autonomous yet? Or with the smart grid and connected electrical uh, charging meters, how can we visualize things that makes the decisions both from an end user as well as from the company being optimal from a sustainability perspective as well as in the efficiency uh, perspective. And of course, how can we make a digital representation of a digital world? I'm working with Imperial College and actually they have done these representations of Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin transactions. And here we can see someone that is getting lots of Bitcoins. The blue part is uh, Bitcoin mi mining. And of course, the volume uh, displayed on different uh, geographies. Here we see a large mining project, but here we see lots of transactions. And this becomes quite interesting because suddenly you understand something that is so abstract like Bitcoin, how it's used, what are the patterns, how can we understand the dynamics in a better way, what are they actually doing when different patterns emerge. And it looks like a star uh, <coughs> screen, but I think this is quite interesting on how to visualize it. Or uh, having a digital representation of the physical world, we are working with the MIT Colorati, and of course you have seen his project, but I think it's good to be reminded. Trash tracking, what happens with trash in uh, Seattle? Um, so they connected all the trash, actually, and suddenly you could see after two days how the trash had moved within Seattle city area. And then after two months you could see different parts of the trash like the e-waste uh, waiting in um, Miami to actually be shipped to Nigeria. Uh, here we have someone that are uh, reusing cell phones, uh, refilling printer cartridges in Mexico. But suddenly we can see something that we cannot understand. But when we visualize it, when we start to connect it, I think this acts as a much better foundation for decisions on what are we actually doing and how can we understand our behavior in a better way to actually be, in this case, much more sustainable. Is this efficient from an energy perspective? Can we do it in a different way? But before we have the visualization, it's hard to actually make decisions. But then in the future with 5G, uh, we are working with Misha Dwaller uh, at King's College and he wants to create tactile internet. We should, not, we should be able not to just see and hear things far away, but also touch and feel them, to transmit, transmit accurately the equivalent of human touch using the bits and bytes of data networks. Big mission, uh, but I think this is the vision on really creating an internet that could be tactile. Last year we showed this uh, as a part of it. Uh, we connected a digger, Oculus Rift, and then we could actually steer the digger from Barcelona, but the digger was in Eskilstuna. Is it a good use case? Yes, to a certain extent, because it could be in remote areas, it could be that it's in dangerous places and so on. Will it create a mass market? Hopefully not, but it proves that we really want to make the possibilities of tactile internet and are investigating what are the future opportunities and what are the demands. How can this technology be utilized to really make good things and make this place a better world? So 5G will, in the bottom, have optimized performance. You will get the uh, gigabit that you need. It will be one abundant access. You will have possibilities to real-time processing and massive automation, both of the networks, but also utilize the network for automation. And hopefully we will give immersive virtual reality real-time everywhere. You will have tactile experiences. 
and you should be able to interact with the reality because everything will more or less be connected to this network. But I think we have a new strategic landscape and based on this morning's discussions and embryos of fear, I think we really, as a research community, as companies, as individuals, as societies, need to understand that we have a new strategic landscape. We have huge opportunities of getting the end users or us as individuals having new experiences, better services. We have huge business opportunities utilizing the ICT to actually create radically new services. But also we have society opportunities and we need to take responsibility to really start doing research development that addresses the big global challenges. And I think there we need a vision on how can we use this technology to really solve some of the big challenges. And based on today's discussion, I think we have a good foundation on addressing these, doing different projects, showing the capabilities of both technology, gaming, drones, etc. But then we need a vision and quoting Rosa Betmos Kante, a vision is not just a picture of what could be. It's an appeal to our best selves, meaning that we should utilize the technology to actually create a better place. But also, it's a call to become something more. Something more as a civilization, something more uh, as an individual or company. But we should see and create a vision that we can utilize this technology for a better world. Thank you very much. And I will stand here, so with oh, a book. The, the present this on this side, was uh, He's here. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I'm sure we have some, some questions first for Erik about the network society, about the... Everyone the wants future. coffee. Everyone wants coffee, but not, not yet, right? We, want, uh, we have some questions for him when he's here. Erik, any questions for Erik? Everyone fell asleep. No, 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 I don't think so. <laughs> oh, Patrick, eager to learn and share. It's good. Yeah, so, so you say 5G will be out in, what was the year? 2020? 2020. 2020. The standardization is yeah. ready. So it's commercially available 2020, but we have it already. So do you have any feel for, say, what percentage of the planet or what pockets on the planet have absolutely no access to anything? And can you kind uh, of predict by, the by future a little? Yeah, uh, by 2020, 300 million people on this planet will have no coverage at all. Uh, I think the best thing with this technology is now 1G and 2G took long time to get coverage. 3G went twice as fast as 2G. 4G went twice as fast as 3G. So we are actually covering people much faster. But by <coughs> 2020, 300 million will live without coverage. I think 1.9 billion people will have 2G coverage if we are not starting to accelerate the rollout of 3G. Uh, 5G will, by 2020, it will be in South Korea, uh, Tokyo, Stockholm, and some other cities, but it will roll out much faster. Yeah, and then do you, do you see kind of possible, can uh, say, conflicting standards due to geopolitical differences with uh, competitors that do not want to? have global standards. Yeah, yeah, of course, some doesn't want to have uh, global standards, but I think now we have proven the case as telecommunication industry, the power of a global standard, because we scale it up, even the poorest people on the earth have access to this technology. It's a business model problem from the operators that not everyone is connected, but still it's affordable for everyone. If we start to fragment the standards, it will never scale, and then uh, we are doing this planet as not good. Mm. So I think all the uh, our competitors, everyone is gathered now to make this a global standard. Okay, thank you. 
Här fram Åsa. Ja, vi hade en fråga där också. Ja, gå ahead och länka. Okay, um, can you please explain a little bit um, the idea of tactile internet, or just give a few examples, or is yeah. just a, no, for a the, vision? Uh, for the example of the digger, of course you got to, you had Oculus Rift to um, see it, but then you have a tactile experience on actually using the digger in Spain, even if the real digger is in Eskilstuna in Sweden. So you get the uh, feel of how it is for the digger operator to actually manage the uh, digger. And we see lots of examples on um, crazy or f where you actually feel um, a virtual hand and you get the same uh, feeling. And then the latency needs to be extremely low and the data burst will be extremely high to gather all that type of data. Even if you are on distance, you could feel that. So it will be much more tactile experiences. Then, of course, we will see especially what the gaming indus industry, etc., will invent based on that. But I think it's really listening to ABB and so on. I think this tactile experience is extremely important in um, industrial processes, uh, in different um, industries, and that could be actually transmitted wirelessly. Yeah, and thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Samo. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Mm, thank you. Uh, and a uh, question maybe from the user's perspective. Mm. Will it be possible, what is the policy on it, to not be connected to the cloud having an iPhone in the future? Oof, um, iPhone wants you to connect to the cloud. Yeah. Um, and of course, they are doing that because they want your data and they want to lock in. Uh, I see more and more discussions among policymakers and so on uh, that you re they will change the laws. Uh, if that will um, make Apple not be able to get you connected to their cloud, I don't know. But I think, thank God, regulators and lawmakers are starting to understand the impact of this technology. And that it needs to be utilized in a good way and not a bad way. And of course, they see also the concentration that more or less five companies own a majority of the end user data on the globe. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Salesforce, which is not good for either competition or development either. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Erik, you will be in the meet and greet area. Yeah, for a short while. I need to go back to Stockholm. Oh. I have a customer at dinner. Okay, yeah. I understand. So you'll be there yeah. right now for yeah. a short, brief moment yeah. during the coffee break, which is now. So uh, enjoy uh, coffee break at a quarter, pa uh, quarter two, quart i fyra. Okay, yeah, there we go. Quarter two, four. We'll be back here again to start. All right, enjoy coffee and thank you, Erik Ruse.